Welcome to the e-learning module about how the AHW maintains the confidentiality of its data. So what is confidentiality? Confidentiality refers to the obligation of data custodians, that is the agencies that collect information, to keep the confidential information they are entrusted with secret. Agencies collecting information from people and organisations have a legal and ethical responsibility to ensure 1. They respect the privacy of those providing the information and 2. That individuals and organisations cannot be identified in a disseminated data set. Let's unpack this a bit. First, we'll have a look at the AHW's legal responsibilities and then we'll have a look at the definition of identified. The AHW is subject to both the Privacy Act and the AHW Act, in particular to Section 29, which refers to confidentiality. These provisions apply to how we manage our data and the amount and type of information about individuals or organisations we disclose in our releases. One thing to note is that the AHW Act goes beyond the Privacy Act in that it requires the Institute to maintain the confidentiality of not only living, but also deceased persons. The Institute holds a large number of data sets on behalf of the Australian Government. These data come from a number of sources including Federal, State and Territory Departments as well as Institute surveys. As part of meeting our legal obligations, these data are held in a secure environment with access restricted to those who require it. What is identifiability? According to the Macquarie Dictionary, to identify is to recognise or establish as being a particular person or thing. In order for confidentiality to be breached, an individual or organisation must be able to be identified in the disseminated data. Next, let's talk about what identifiability is. Identifiability of an entity, that is, a person or organisation, in disseminated data might be defined in a number of ways. The first way is that the entity can identify themselves. This is a very stringent definition and would lead to very little data being able to be disseminated. The second possible definition is that others can identify the entity. This is often referred to as identity disclosure. This is the approach used by many government organisations. The third definition is that in addition to identifying the entity, others must learn additional information about them. This is known as attribute disclosure. And finally, the fourth possible definition is that an entity is identified only if the name and address of the entity is revealed. So which definition has the Institute adopted? The Institute has adopted the Attribute Disclosure definition of identifiability. So to recap, Attribute Disclosure is when, upon identifying an entity, you learn something you didn't know before. Let's have a look at an example that shows what we mean. Table 1 contains information about the relapse status of clients participating in a trial rehabilitation program. It contains information about the drug of dependency and also whether the client has relapsed or not. Take note of the row uh, for amphetamine use. If you know a person who has taken part in the trial program and that their drug of dependency is amphetamine, this table reveals that they relapsed. This is attribute disclosure. The table couldn't be released in its current form and the Institute would undergo further work to confidentialise the data. Next I'll draw your attention to the row relating to cocaine users and in particular to the small value in the relapse column. To identify that a person falls into this cell you have to first know that they took part in the trial program. You have to secondly know that they're a cocaine user 
And the third piece of information you have to know is that they suffered a relapse. Once you've used this information to locate the person in this cell, there is no additional information in the table for you to learn. Under the attribute disclosure definition, which has been adopted by the Institute, this cell does not pose a disclosure risk and can be safely released. The Institute has a policy on reporting to manage confidentiality and reliability. It was introduced in November 2013 and applies to all AHW staff. It covers all material released in Institute publications and online releases. This diagram shows the steps involved in applying the policy to tabular data. Examining the table, the first question we ask is whether there are any ratios or proportions with the denominator of less than 100. This is not strictly speaking a confidentiality issue, but rather an issue of reliability and volatility. If any such ratios or proportions are found, then those cells are suppressed, collapsed, or otherwise remediated before we move on. The second question that we ask is whether there are any additional data provider or client constraints. Data providers can specify at the time of provision any additional constraints beyond the confidentiality policy of the HW that they would like applied to any data released. This is to ensure that they too meet their legal obligations. If any such constraints exist, we apply them to the table at this point. The next question that we ask is whether the data are already publicly available in the form that they currently are. If so, then no further confidentialisation is required. If not, then we move on. A close examination of the table will reveal whether there are any single non-zero cells in a row or in a column or a wafer. If this is the case, then these cells carry a risk of disclosure. We flag them for later consideration and then continue to examine the table. The next question contains two parts. The first part is whether the table contains data relating to organisations. If so, we then ask ourselves whether there are any cells that have one or two major contributors. By a major contributor, we mean one organisation that contributes 85% or more of the cell value, or two organisations that together contribute 90% or more of the cell value. If so, we also flag these cells as having disclosure risk. At this point, we have to look beyond the table in question to consider whether there are multiple tables containing related data in this data release. If so, we have to look for any combination of tables that may lead to a disclosure risk. An example of this would be where one table contains the number of individuals within a cross-classification and a second table contains summary statistics about those individuals. If we identify any uh, disclosure risks, then we add this to the list of flagged cells. Now we have finished our examination of the table and the question that we ask is whether any cells have been flagged as having a disclosure risk. If not, then the policy requirements have been met and the table is ready for release. If there are any flagged cells, then the final question that we ask ourselves is whether the attribute is sensitive or not. An example of a sensitive attribute would be disability status, and a non-sensitive attribute would be state of usual residence. If the attribute is not sensitive, then the policy requirements have been met and the data can be released. If the attributes are sensitive, then we move on to confidentialise the data. The approach that the AHW may take when confidentialising a table include modifying the table structure, collapsing cells, suppressing cells or perturbing cells. With the adoption of the attribute disclosure definition of identifiability in the updated confidentiality policy, 
The two main changes that users of the Institute's data will have noticed are that cell size is no longer in itself a driver of confidentialization. In many cases, small cells can be published, whilst in a few cases, large cells cannot be published. The second change is that, with this approach, the amount of suppression required in Institute data releases is reduced, which in turn increases the value of our data to users. That completes this module on confidentiality. Thank you for your interest. Should you wish to provide feedback or have any additional questions about the material covered, please contact the Institute's Statistical Advisor using the contact information provided.